All right, welcome back. Um, so we got through test one. Don't forget about the lab quiz tomorrow on Thursday. And as I mentioned in the email, um, as usual, that's going to open up at midnight or 12.01 uh, tomorrow morning. And then it'll, it's due before 11.59 p.m. tomorrow night. So just make sure that you do that at some point in the next day. Any questions on any of that stuff? Nope. Cool. All right. So we're going to move on to, we're going to spend two days on bones. And then next week, we're going to get on to the hip and thigh. So if it'll let me advance here. There we go. All right, important functions of bone. Some of these are kind of lame and uninteresting, but a couple of them are pretty interesting. So obviously one of the functions of bone is to support the body, provides structure for the body, right? And so another way of thinking about that or way of conceptualizing that is that the uh, legs, the lower limbs, support the upper body or support the trunk. Obviously the skeleton provides some protection. So if we think about the flat bones of the skull, those are going to protect the brain. And then the vertebrae, which are the bones of your spine, those are going to protect your spinal cord. So you've got bony protection for the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal cord. And then you also have bony protection inside of the thorax. So you've got bony protection between the ribs and the sternum for your heart and your lungs as well. So there's some bony protection for those structures. Obviously, the bones provide levers for movement, so muscles insert into the bones, and when the muscles contract, they, two, they pull two bones closer together, causes angular motion, and that allows us to move. So bones are important in generating movement because they serve as sites for muscle attachment. One of the things that you're probably less aware of is that bones serve as a site for mineral storage. So there are certain things that we can store in the body and other things that we can't, um, and so bones are one of our storage sites. So more specifically, uh, we store calcium and phosphorus in the bones. And calcium is, well, phosphorus is important. Calcium is uh, probably the more important of the two. Um, so in terms of calcium storage, we have to maintain blood calcium within fairly narrow limits. Can't get too high, can't get too low, because we need calcium for a variety of functions. So for example, calcium is intimately involved in regulating the rhythm of your heart. And so if your calcium levels drop too low, it's going to affect heart rhythm. You won't be able to generate nice rhythmic contractions in the heart. It's going to affect muscle contraction. And it's also going to affect the central nervous system. Because in the central nervous system, we use calcium in part to help us regulate blood flow, but also in the release of neurotransmitters. As you saw when we talked about the um, neuromuscular junction, that calcium is involved in the release of those neurotransmitters. So if we don't have enough calcium, can't release neurotransmitters, can't send signals from the central nervous system to other tissues. So in order to allow us to have enough calcium to function, we sort of have this, this savings account, if you will, of calcium, which is inside of the bones. So the, so the bones then serve as a site for storage of calcium and also phosphorus. We form our blood cells inside of bones, uh, in adults, more specifically, inside of the flat bones. So for the most part, adults make red blood cells and white blood cells, but primarily red blood cells inside of the bones of the axial skeleton. So you produce it in, in the flat bones. So the flat bones include the skull, the sternum, the ribs, um, and then the pelvis also falls into that category for right now. So we produce most of our red blood cells then in those flat bones and again in the bones, which are the bones primarily of the axial skeleton. Triglycerides are fat, so you store fat inside of the bones as well, and we see that more in adulthood. Kids, infants in particular, um, don't have very much fat inside of their bones, but as we mature and the bones develop, inside of that medullary cavity, inside of the cavity of long bones, we store fat, and that's referred to as yellow marrow. And the reason it's yellow is because of the high triglyceride content, because of the high fat content. So the inside of bones then serve as a site for fat storage as well. Hormone production. I changed this part of the slide a little bit right before class. So if you've already printed out the slides, it's going to look a little bit different than what you saw um, on Canvas. So the hormone that is produced by the bones is called osteocalcin. And so on the original slideshow, it said osteocalcin, comma, insulin. So and the reason I changed that is I didn't want anybody to get the impression that the bones produce insulin because, of course, that's produced by the pancreas. But 
uh, osteocalcin plays a role in regulating insulin secretion from the pancreas. So that's why it said that. So there is that aspect of things. So osteocalcin plays a role in regulating insulin secretion. Insulin released by your pancreas. What insulin does, or y'all probably know, what does insulin do? Anybody know? Yep. Yeah. So if your blood sugar gets too high, or not when it gets too high, but when your blood sugar increases, like after a meal, your blood sugar is going to go up, your pancreas is going to release calcium, and so, uh, or not calcium, it's going to release insulin, sorry. Um, and so then insulin is going to cause you to pull sugar from the bloodstream and store it in the muscles, or to convert it to fat and store it inside of your adipocytes. So that's what insulin does. So then osteocalcin released from the bones regulates insulin secretion. But more interestingly, and uh, newer research is showing that it plays a role in the regulation of uh, synthesis of certain neurotransmitters. So things like serotonin and dopamine. So this research is, is uh, or has occurred primarily in the last 10 years. And so what they've found is that osteocalcin can actually cross the blood-brain barrier and then get into the brain and then affect neuron, uh, again, neurotransmitter production. But it also has some influence over a particular gene called RBAP48. Took a little while to memorize that, RBAP48. And what that gene does is it makes a protein by the same name, RBAP48, and that protein is involved in converting short-term memory to long-term memory. And so as we age, we tend to get increasingly forgetful. So sometimes um, when you're talking to people, oftentimes in their 60s or older, they'll forget something and they'll be like, oh, I had a senior moment. And so that's called benign sentient forgetfulness. And so one of the reasons that that happens is because of decreased expression of that gene, RBAP48, which results in decreased production of that same protein, which results in a decreased ability for us to turn short-term short memories into long-term memories. And that's important for learning. So if I want to learn uh, you know, how to navigate this building or navigate a new building, I'll go in there one time and I'll remember, okay, I got to take my second right to get to this office. If I can't convert that short-term memory to a long-term memory, the next time I come back into that building, I won't remember how to get where I need to go. Okay, yep. Yeah, so the way to maintain that is through exercise, right? And so what ends up happening is as we, as we age, our bone mass decreases. So we, we talked about how the body, basically everything kind of operates on this use it or lose it. So you can build muscle mass, lift weights, get bigger muscles, and then if you stop working out, well, that muscle mass goes away. If you don't use it, you lose it. Same thing with bone mass. You can increase bone mass through exercise and diet, you know, the combination of weight-bearing exercise or high-impact exercise plus calcium and vitamin D and a sufficient amount of the macronutrients, you can maximize your bone density. But if you don't use it, you know, if you sit around being sedentary for 30 years, you're going to lose it. So for all of us, bone mass is going to decrease across the lifespan. And that drop-off can be larger the less active you are, the less you exercise, right? So the more you're able to maintain bone mass, the more effectively you're able to continue to produce this protein and so the more effectively you're able to continue to produce this protein, it has, it has a, an impact on your ability to function mentally. And interestingly, in some uh, mouse studies, what they've done is in young mice, they've knocked out that gene. So the young mice then can't produce the protein. They can't convert short-term to long-term memories. And then they, they function then when they have to do cognitive tasks like navigating a maze. They act like old mice, even though they are the equivalent of adolescent or early 20s in terms of chronological age for these mice. Conversely, if you take older mice who aren't functioning very well cognitively and you inject osteocalcin into their hippocampus, which is a region of the brain that's associated with memories and learning, then they start to perform just like the young mice did. So they increase their, their uh, expression of that gene, increase the production of the protein, and so then their cognition returns and their memory returns. So as always, or as I'm going to repeat a lot in this class, don't stop moving. Because the longer you can hang on to your muscle mass, the longer you can hang on to your bone mass, the more effectively you're going to function not only physically, but also mentally. So, and that, um, those rat studies or those mouse studies were only conducted in 2019. So this is really new research. Um, the textbook doesn't say anything about that. It just talks about insulin secretion. So osteocalcin is one of those, those hormones that uh, we're discovering some new interesting things about it. All right, so some of this is review. Um, so what's included in the axial skeleton? What bones or what groups of bones? Bones, 
David pointed to him, right? So your axial skeleton then is your skull, your spine. And remember the spine bones are your vertebrae. So your skull, your spine, your ribs, and your sternum. Sometimes the pelvis is grouped in there, sometimes it's not. But let's say skull, spine, ribs, sternum. So that's your axial skeleton, and then everything else is your appendicular skeleton. So in the case of the upper body, clavicle, scapula, working distally. In the case of the lower body, pelvis, working distally. In terms of the classification of bones, they're classified based on their shape, not necessarily their size. So there's four basic classifications. The first one, as you can see there, is long bones. So long bones are longer than they are short, or not, <laughs> that didn't make sense. Longer than they are wide, sorry. Long bones are longer than they are wide. Um, so the uh, bones of the appendicular skeleton are primarily long bones. So in the case of the upper body, with the exception of the scapula and the carpal bones, everything else is a long bone. So most of the bones in your appendages, in your arms and legs, are long bones. Same thing in the lower body, with the exception of the pelvis and the tarsal bones, which are these seven short bones in the foot. They're analogous to the carpal bones in the hand. With those two exceptions, everything else in the lower body is a long bone. Now again, when we say long bone, all we mean is that it's longer than it is wide. So it's not necessarily actually a long bone. So for example, the distal phalanx of your fifth digit that little pinky bone there, that's a long bone, but compared to something like the humerus, it doesn't seem that long. But again, it's just based on the shape, not the actual physical length. It doesn't have to be, you know, three inches long to be a long bone. It just has to be longer than it is wide. Short bones then, basically cuboid. They're little cubes for the most part. Now there's some, some um, they're not exactly cubes, right? Because all eight of your carpal bones are short bones. But, um, you know, some of them like the pisiform, well, that's more of a sphere. The uh, trapezoid is fairly cuboid. You actually have a bone in your foot called the cuboid. But then others, like the handmate, have kind of a weird shape to them. But in general, so they're kind of a, a cube shape. Those are your short bones. Flat bones obviously are flat. So flat bones include the scapula, the sternum, your ribs, and the bones of the skull. Scapula, sternum, ribs, skull bones. Those are your flat bones. And again, where those are going to be important is in the flat bones, you have red bone marrow, and red bone marrow is where we make red blood cells. So that's most of your blood cell production is in those flat bones. So that's why they matter. And then the irregular bones don't fit any other category. So for example, the, the vertebrae are kind of the go-to for every anatomy textbook for your irregular bones, because they have a, a sort of cylindrical anterior aspect, and then they have some flat components to the posterior aspect, and then the, the big neural arch. And so they don't really fit into any category. So those are your irregular bones, your vertebrae. And some of the skull bones would fall under irregular. Like if you get into like the sphenoid and some of the other ones we'll talk about with the skull, those would be irregular as well. All right, just as an aside in terms of classification, so bones are organs because they contain multiple different types of tissue. So in terms of terminology, remember that a tissue is a group of the same type of cell working together. So we talked about skeletal muscle tissue. And so for skeletal muscle tissue, you have a bunch of skeletal muscle cells, muscle fibers, all working together. But in a, in a full skeletal muscle, you not only have those skeletal muscle cells, but you also have arteries, nerves, and veins, right? And then some lymphatic tissue around it. So um, because you've got other types of tissue in there, then that makes a, a skeletal muscle an organ. Same concept with bones. Most of it's osseous tissue or bony tissue, but then you also have arteries, nerves, and veins, and then lymphatic tissue as well. And so because you have other different types of tissue in there, that's what's going to make it an organ. So in terms of the structure, um, so we're going to talk not about chemical structure of bone, really, um, a little bit, but mostly gross and microscopic. And we're going to actually start with microscopic. So when we look at bone in a close-up, there are two broad categories of bone. So, so most of the time, or what we've done so far, when we look at the humerus, when we look at the radius, et cetera, bone is uh, fairly compact. There aren't really any holes in it. Um, and it's pretty dense. That's that outer layer of bone. So that really dense, compact bone is called cortical bone. 
So the outer layer on all the bones we've talked about, that's cortical bone. And then inside of that, you have another type of bone called trabecular or spongy bone. And I kind of alternate terminology, I apologize in advance, but trabecular and spongy bone are the same thing. So oftentimes people refer to the trabecular bone as the bone marrow. The marrow actually kind of runs in between the trabecular bone. So the trabecular bone on this picture then, so what this is, this is your parietal bone, so one of the flat bones of the skull. So you have this superficial layer of cortical or compact bone, and then you have your trabecular or spongy bone in the middle, and then deeper, you have another layer of compact or cortical bone. So your flat bones then are kind of the sandwich of cortical and trabecular bone. And then between the trabeculae, that's where you have your bone marrow. So if you see the inside of the bone, you're like, that's the bone marrow with the little spider web looking stuff. That's actually the trabeculae. So it's a type of bone. The marrow itself, again, is between those. In terms of the arrangement of short, irregular, and flat bones, so as mentioned, for flat bones, it's sort of a sandwich of cortical bone with trabecular bone between. For your um, flat bones, it's, I'm sorry, for your uh, short bones, it's cortical bone, and then all of the inside of that is trabecular bone. And the difference there, why I mention that, is because when we talk about long bones here in a second, there's a cavity in the middle. So for each of these three, your short, irregular, and uh, flat bones, there's no cavity. So there's no what's referred to as a medullary cavity, and the spelling of that's on the next slide. So all of it's filled in by trabecular bone. So just as a curiosity question, like in, a, in one of the flat bones of the skull like this, why is the inside of the skull not cortical bone? Like why do we have two different types of bone? Why not just have it all be cortical? Yep, Addy? Okay, yep, it is harder for sure. Um, uh, other thoughts, is it Megan or Laura? Yeah, Megan. Megan, okay. Okay, yep, that's another good thought. All right, so it helps with impact. So one of the advantages of your trabecular bone is it acts kind of like struts on a bridge. So you've got these trabeculae that effectively kind of run this direction, so at an oblique angle here, and then you've got another set that effectively kind of run like this. So it looks like it's just this random pattern of bone, but it's not. They align along the lines of stress, and they actually remodel. If you compress the bone a lot, they'll remodel to resist those compressive stresses. If you stretch the bone a lot, they'll remodel to resist those tensile stresses. And so one of the things about them is they can remodel fairly quickly. Um, in terms of an advantage of trabecular bone over cortical bone, it's lighter. So you have a pretty good amount of strength, not as good as cortical bone, but because you're filling in those gaps with blood vessels, but also with um, bone marrow, it's a lighter type of bone. If we were all cortical bone, that would add several pounds to each of us, and the, the more we weigh, the higher the energy cost to move. And so this is one of the ways that we save energy. One of the things that the body is really good at is using as little energy as possible to do most things, right? And so that's one of the things that makes weight loss hard. Yep. Huh? Yeah, so, um, so the, the concept of being big boned per se is not like, it's not really a thing, but certainly there is some genetic variance in our bone density. And there is some impact on the type of training that you do if you do uh, like weight bearing training where you're walking or where you're actually like lifting weights. Or the most effective type of training at, at increasing your bone mass is actually impact training. So like jumping, um, running, because you have to slam your foot down every time. That increases bone density a lot more. And so, yeah, they would have more bone density. Um, there's a study coming out, I think later this year, on some of the world's strongest men competitors, and they have uh, the highest bone density that's ever been measured on, in two of the most elite ones, um, in, in part because they have lots of muscle mass, right? The more you lift weights, the more um, strain it puts on the bones, and so that causes you to lay down additional bone mass. But just that loading from, you know, if you're lifting 1,000 pounds, you're really loading the spine and the lower body, and so you lay down additional bone mass to that. So yeah, there's certainly some variance based on training and genetics. Yep. Yep. It takes about six months to see a measurable difference in bone density. 
Um, and so they don't detrain long enough that they're going to lose much. Um, so it, it would be hard to pick up on the, on most of the techniques that we use. Like so for that, uh, that's a an X-ray based scan that they're using for that. So you wouldn't be able to pick it up. But yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, muscle adapts pretty quickly. Muscle's like four to eight weeks. So one to two months, but yeah, bone takes a lot longer, so six months to really see an appreciable difference there. Now, like fracture healing time, if you actually break a bone and you're fixing it, that takes six weeks, two months, something like that. So that's a little bit faster, but actually you know, increasing and decreasing to be able to measure it takes a little bit longer than that. All right, so typical long bone. So some terminology on this slide, as you can see. Um, so as mentioned, the bones that we've been talking about primarily are your long bones. So this is a sort of schematic of the humerus there. So there's three basic parts to a long bone. The first is the diaphysis. So the diaphysis is the shaft of the bone. It's the part of the humerus that we didn't talk about that much. Right? So the only thing we talked about on the, on the diaphysis of the humerus was the deltoid tuberosity. Everything else we're kind of like, eh, it's the middle of the bone. So the diaphysis is the shaft of a long bone. The term on there, medullary cavity, that's that cavity in the middle of the bone that is filled in with yellow marrow in adults. So again, that's where that triglyceride storage occurs. And you can see that on that depiction. You can see this yellow stuff here in the middle. So there's, there's a cavity in the middle of your long bones. And again, we don't see that in the short bones, the flat bones, or the irregular bones. So the medullary cavity, the opening, is in the diaphysis. Then we're actually going to skip metaphysis for a second, and we're going to go to epiphysis. So the way I've written it there, epiphysis is singular, but each of your long bones is going to have two. And so that's an, those are epiphyses, so it's ES instead of IS. Um, so your epiphyses are the rounded ends of the long bone. So in the case of the humerus, the proximal epiphysis includes the humeral head and the greater and lesser tubercles. So all of that proximal aspect is basically everything from the surgical neck up. That's the proximal epiphysis of the humerus. On the distal aspect, it includes the condyles. And we didn't talk about the condyles much, but included there, you've got the trochlea, the capitulum, and the medial and lateral epicondyle. So all of those fall under the distal epiphysis of the humerus. But speaking broadly, the epiphyses are the rounded ends of long bones. So that's kind of the thing to know for now. And then, coming back to the middle, the metaphysis is the widened area between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. So in the case of the humerus, thinking distally is, is where it's most obvious, you've got, remember those, the medial and lateral supracondylar ridges? So where those are, in case you don't remember, so you've got this area where the bone flares or widens right here. This is the medial supracondylar ridge. Here's the lateral supracondylar ridge. So that would fall under the, the category of the metaphysis. So the metaphysis is, is that widened area before the epiphysis. Why does that matter, or why is the metaphysis important? That's where your epiphyseal plate is. So your epiphyseal plate is your growth plate. So that's the more colloquial term for that. So before you reach skeletal maturity, you're going to have growth plates in your bone. Those growth plates are hyaline cartilage. That's the way that long bones grow in length, is actually at that growth plate, hence the name, or at, at the epiphyseal plate. So before you reach skeletal maturity, which means you're done growing, which in, in men is approximately age 21, in women, approximately age 18. So before you reach skeletal maturity, you're going to have cartilaginous plates, hyaline cartilage there, in the metaphysis of the long bone. So in this case, you're looking at a posterior view of the left knee. And so you can see in the distal femur here, you've got this fairly thin line. So that's, a, that's a, an epiphyseal plate, that's a growth plate. And then you can see similar structures. So in the fibula, the small bone of your lower leg, there's one right there in the fibular head. And then there's the one in the tibia. So looking at x-rays, you can get an idea of how old the person is, at least if they're before skeletal maturity, by how wide those are. When they're younger, those are fairly wide, and as they get older and older and older, older those shrink, right? And because you're, you're laying down additional bones, you've got more calcified tissue, and so you end up shrinking the growth plate. So this, the person in this picture is probably 16, 17 years old, maybe a little bit older than that, because those growth plates are pretty narrow. They're still there, but they're fairly small. Why do those matter? 
The reason those matter is because they are hyaline cartilage, not bone, those are weak spots in the bone. Remember, those are effectively, or those can be categorized as being joints because you've got two ends of the bone connected by hyaline cartilage. And so those are weak spots. So kids get different types of injuries than adults do to their bones specifically because of those growth plates. So oftentimes kids will get a growth plate fracture from like if they fall from height, they can actually compress that, that growth plate and potentially cause it to stop growing, uh, cause it to stop laying down new bone. So that's an injury obviously that an adult wouldn't get because we don't have those. Um, one of the things that can be tricky about those too is again, because those are weak spots in the bone. Um, so for example, um, working as a contract athletic trainer for a high school, we had a kid, football player, I think he's a freshman, who got a, a really big knee injury. Kid fell on the outside of his knee or somebody fell on the outside of this player's knee and so his knee buckled immediately. And so when that happened, when I put some stress on the outside of his leg and pushed it immediately, the knee opened right up. So you would assume then he probably injured his medial collateral ligament of his knee, which I did. I was like, ah, obviously that's an MCL injury. We'll send him to the doctor, but I know what's going on here. <laughs> and so he comes back from the doctor and his note says he has a growth plate fracture. And I was like, what? That was obviously an MCL injury. And so what happens is uh, um, in kids, the um, connections to the bones of their tendons and their ligaments are oftentimes stronger than the bones themselves in some ways. And so what happened with this kid, because again, this is a, a view of the knee. So your MCL, because this is the medial aspect of the knee, the MCL basically runs from right here to down here. So again, it's going to keep the knee from buckling this way. And so what he did was he actually pulled part of the bone off here. Um, actually, it's a little bit lower. So he pulled off down here at the growth plate. And so the ligament itself was still fully intact. It had just pulled away from the bone. Um, and so that's one of the things that can kind of fool you with kids. Now, does that really change the way that that's going to be treated? No, but it could, depending upon the extent of that growth plate fracture. So it's just something to be aware of if you're working with kids, um, their susceptibility to different kinds of injuries than adults are going to suffer. In an adult, like if that had been a, you know, a college player, clearly an MCL, probably a mid-substance, like in the middle of the ligament type of an injury. But in a kid, it's not quite as straightforward. All right, speaking of, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't know, I was thinking about that with a Dak Prescott injury this weekend, actually. Uh, I happened to turn the game on like right as that happened. And so I called my son up, he was in the basement. I was like, hey, come check this out. And he didn't think it was as cool as I did. Um, I noticed later when they showed the replay of that, that uh, they were like blurring it out. Um, I was like, that wasn't that bad. I mean, it was gross, but. Um, so in his case, um, not specific to your question, but like in that case, the fracture is almost better because the fracture healing time itself is, you know, give or take eight weeks. They had to obviously use plates and screws and all of that. And if he'd been, he had a dislocation too. So he also had a sprain. Um, so his, if he just had to pick one or the other, the fracture is going to heal more effectively and the joint will still function normally rather than if you had sprained the ligaments. So it would be preferable in that case to have a fracture. Now he had both, which sucks. And so he has like a six month turnaround. Um, but specific to kids, the hard part with the growth plate fractures is that sometimes then that can, all, that can change the way the cartilage functions at that growth plate. And so they'll, the cells can stop dividing. And so now you get that growth plate has stopped growing, but the one on the other side hasn't. And so you get this imbalance between the two. So that is something primarily with like compression fractures is where we see that. So usually like a fall from height, they fall out of a tree or something. Um, that's where that becomes dangerous. But you get, there's a whole classification system that we might talk about next time where there's like a fracture kind of in through here and then you separate this. Um, so it depends on what kind of fracture we're talking about. Um, but in general, like with that kid, it wasn't separated enough to do anything about. Um, sometimes they'll get avulsion fractures like in, in the muscles around the hip and stuff where they'll pull off and they may have to screw them back on, which you wouldn't really do with an adult. Um, so that becomes a little problematic, but yeah. That didn't answer your question at all, did it? No, that's okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they do heal faster. Um, what, what you primarily don't want are those compression fractures where you smash the chondrocytes. Yeah. Oh, whoops. I gotta give you my case study. All right, so we're gonna pretend that you're an athletic trainer at, at the high school level. So you're dealing with, uh, you're working with high school basketball. Let's go with that. 
and one of your basketball athletes is a freshman he's 14 years old comes to you and tells you he's got pain on the anterior aspect of his knee that's been going on for a long time he doesn't know how long let's say weeks to maybe a couple months the pain has been getting progressively worse it is particularly worse when he runs and especially when he has to like stop and change directions that hurts a lot and that again hurts in the front of the knee jumping is also painful but more painful than going up is coming down so when he lands from the jump that really hurts like a sharp stabbing pain in the front of his leg sometimes he even falls down because it's so painful so it hurts during practice but one of the things actually is that as he gets going and he gets warm it gets a little bit better and then after practice when he cools down it gets worse gets really stiff and painful and you notice he has an obvious deformity on the front of his knee that looks like this so he has this pretty obvious knob there some of you have probably had this condition anybody know what's going on yep Addy. okay It is that one. Yeah, so it's Osgood Schlatter's disease, so named for two physicians. A lot, of, a lot of different conditions are named for the physicians that first described them in the medical literature. And so this one is no exception. So Osgood Schlatter's disease, pretty common, um, especially in your taller athletes and in your jumping athletes. So what, what happens is, so the bones are going to, again, grow in length at those growth plates. So you're going to lay down, the, the chondrocytes are going to proliferate, they're going to get more of them. You're going to lay down some uh, cartilage initially, and then it's going to harden into calcified bone. So the bones are going to grow, and then the muscles actually have to catch up. So the muscles, after the bones have grown, will lay down some additional sarcomeres. So they will, uh, you know, remember Z-line to Z-line, they'll lay down some more of those, and then the muscle will grow in length. But in that interval where the bone has grown but the muscle hasn't, now the muscle is pulling at its origin and its insertion, and so that constant pull is going to be pretty uncomfortable. And if you combine that constant pull with lots of sprinting and running and jumping and all of that, so in this case, we're talking about the quad muscle group, the group of muscles on the front of the thigh, and we're talking about their insertion into something called the tibial tuberosity, this big knob on the front of your knee. And so what ends up happening then, the quads are really powerful knee extensors. They straighten your leg. So when you jump, they extend the knee as you jump up. And then they, they help slow you down. You get an eccentric contraction as you, as you land from a jump. And so um, there's already that tension there from a big growth spurt. And if we combine that with running and jumping, you get an overload of the insertion of those muscles into the tibial tuberosity. Under some of those muscle insertions, you have a growth plate as well, or a cartilaginous plate. And so um, that, again, is a weak spot in the bone. And so if you combine the, the tension that's there because the muscle isn't quite long enough, plus repetitive high-intensity muscle contractions, the, the muscle can start to pull that plate away a little bit because, again, you've got a weak spot in the bone here. So you'll start to pull that plate away a little bit, and then the body responds by initiating inflammation and trying to lay down a bunch of extra bone. So it knows that that's a weak spot, so it's going to try to calcify that as much as it can and as fast as it can. And so that's when you get that really obvious deformity is from the body trying to compensate from that weak spot to basically try to keep your quad tendon from pulling away from your tibia. Uh, it's going to lay down a bunch of additional bone. And with that inflammatory process, you get swelling, you get sensitization of the free nerve endings, and so you get pain, right? So in that case, osgood schlatter's disease is a growth plate issue, or more specifically, it's an apophysis issue. So an apophysis is a cartilaginous plate underneath the insertion of a tendon or a ligament. So in this case, it's underneath the insertion of the quadriceps tendon or patellar tendon. So you can get a similar issue um, actually at the inferior pole of the patella. So this is your kneecap. So there's, there's a growth plate here too. Uh, and so sometimes rather than getting the um, growth plate problem down here on the tibia, we can actually get it on the lower part of the patella and that's called sending larsen johansson disease for three different doctors. Um, or if any of you were soccer players, a really common one in soccer players and sometimes in basketball players is in the back of your heel um, on the calcaneus is your heel bone. Um, and so that's called Severs disease, again, for another doctor. So they're all the same classification of injury. They're all apophysitis, an inflammation of the insertion uh, of a muscle. And so um, what would we do about that if, if we had a you know, high school basketball player comes in with this? Is there anything I can do for him? Eddie, what'd you do? Okay. Did it help? No, I wouldn't think so. Yep. 
Yep. Yep. So the ice helps with the pain some. It doesn't really solve the problem. It just makes it hurt less for a little while um, until you warm back up. Um, so there's a couple different things you can do. Sometimes they put a strap around it, and you probably, I don't know if you tried that, but that helps some. Um, and so you'll see, like, if you're familiar with uh, ankle taping, they put that base layer of stuff on there, that, that uh, pre-tape. So you can take that same stuff, wrap it around your tibia a bunch of times, and then kind of roll it. And that sort of pushes the pressure across the entire tibial tuberosity rather than just at one spot. Sometimes that helps, not really. The only thing that's really going to help this is rest unfortunately, which is not, if you're talking about to, you know, high school athletes, that's not what they or their parents want to hear. <laughs> like, oh, you should sit out for a couple weeks. <laughs> They're not real excited about that option. But what you're doing then is you're trying to let the muscle growth catch up to that growth spurt. You're trying to, to let the muscle lay down those additional sarcomeres. You can do some stretching with this. Foam rolling would be a better option because then you're not putting tension on the, the origin or the insertion. Um, you can take anti-inflammatories, but if you're in, interfering with the inflammatory process, um, that's probably going to slow down your healing time, so you don't necessarily want to do that. So the primary thing here is rest, um, like I said, some foam rolling, and then um, change of activities for a few weeks, maybe have them do the upper body bike or something for a little while. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so that's, that's primarily the, the muscle tension, just pulling on those things, yeah. So, um, yep. All right, so other stuff about bone. So in terms of membranes, so there's two important membranes to talk about. The first is the periosteum. So the periosteum is the outer covering of the bone. And the periosteum itself has two layers. So in all the bones we talked about, humerus, et cetera, they all have a periosteum. Um, the periosteum doesn't extend into the joint, which is kind of worth mentioning. So the hyaline cartilage is not covered by the periosteum. Um, so it's the outer covering of the bone. The most superficial layer is called the fibrous layer, and that is dense, irregular connective tissue. So you've got collagen fibers going all kinds of different directions. It also has perforating fibers called Sharpie's fibers, and those actually are collagen strands that run into the bone matrix itself. So those perforating fibers or the Sharpie's fibers connect that periosteum, that outer covering of the bone, to the matrix of the bone itself. So they sort of anchor it. The reason that matters, or one of the reasons that matters, is that your tendons, which connect muscles to bones, insert into the periosteum. So the, the collagen from the tendon sort of interweaves with the periosteum, and that's how the muscle actually inserts into the bone, and then the periosteum is anchored into the bone matrix. And so then that's how you get those good, strong connections between the tendon and the bone itself, specifically between the tendon and the periosteum, and then the periosteum is anchored to the matrix. Underneath that, you've got the osteogenic layer, so osteo means bone. Anything genic is the origin of. So the osteogenic layer is where we generate new bone. So bones grow in two ways. The first is called interstitial growth. And so interstitial growth is what I was describing at the growth plates. And we'll talk about that in more detail on Friday. But the second type of growth is appositional growth. And so in appositional growth, you've got growth on the outside of the bone or on the superficial aspect of the bone. So when a bone remodels, like if you load a bone to get the bone density like the strongman we talked about, when you load that bone, you're going to lay down additional bone mass on the outside of the bone. So underneath the periosteum at that osteogenic layer. So it'll grow on the outside. And then you actually um, you have osteoclasts, which break down bone, on the inside of the bone. And they're going to break down those older layers of cortical bone. So you add additional bone, but you break down those older layers to keep the bone from getting too heavy, such that, again, the energy cost of moving doesn't get too high. And there's a term on there, periostitis. So remember that an itis is an inflammation. Anybody ever had shin splints? OK, yeah, David, Natty, all right. So David, tell me about shin splints. What were some of the symptoms you experienced? Like what brought it on? What did it feel like? Where did it hurt? OK. Okay, good, yep. All right, and so um, what kind of pain are we talking? Okay. What, did you do anything that was effective at treating it or making it better? Okay, yeah, so not a ton usually. So shin splints are a periostitis. And so again, an itis is an inflammation. So peri uh, periostitis then is an inflammation of the periosteum. 
And so what happens there, the most common muscle involved in shin splints is a muscle called tibialis anterior. And so tibialis anterior is a muscle on the lateral aspect of your shin, so it's this muscle right here. And so your shin bone is called your tibia. So that ridge there is pretty obvious in most of us. So there's your tibia. And then here's your tibialis anterior. Its tendon runs down here along the top of your foot and actually wraps underneath your foot and inserts on the tarsal bones. So the, the seven close bones of the foot, it inserts on two of them. Um, so what tibialis anterior does, that muscle on the front of your shin, it picks your foot up and then also inverts the foot. So inversion is like when you roll your ankle when the bottom of your foot points toward the midline, that's inversion. So um, tibialis posterior does combination of dorsiflexion, picking your foot up, and then inversion. So why that muscle would get inflamed during running, a few things. Things that often precipitate it um, are changes in surface. So if somebody goes from like running on a treadmill all the time, let's say, you know, in the winter and spring, and then the weather's nice, they go outside and they're going to go run on some asphalt, that really hard surface causes a lot of shaking, right? So a lot of vibration forces that go up the bone, but it also causes a lot of shaking in the muscles. And so from absorbing the shock of running on that really hard surface, tibialis anterior is going to shake all along its origin on the tibia here. And so it's going to pull away from the bone some, right? And so it's going to pull away from that periosteum and that's going to cause an inflammation. So that's one of the things that can cause it is that repetitive vibration force. Another thing is actually going the other way on your surfaces. So if you run on a relatively uh, stiff surface, so like basketball courts or you know, tracks or whatever, and then you switch to running on astroturf, right? If you're on, if you're on artificial turf, it's typically pretty soft, has a lot of give to it. Um, and so when you're on that unstable surface, all those muscles around your foot have to contract harder to help stabilize the foot. And so tibialis anterior is one of the important muscles in stabilizing your medial longitudinal arch, which is the primary arch of the foot. And so then it becomes uh, much more active than it's used to being. And so then that can precipitate that inflammation as well. So it's, it's oftentimes either going from hard surfaces to soft surfaces or vice versa, um, sometimes poorly fitting footwear. So particularly if you're sort of flat footed, so if you have a collapsed medial longitudinal arch, because that muscle runs underneath the foot, if your foot's flat, it's actually gonna stretch that tendon out. And so then that, that extra tension is hard on the muscle. So if you, sometimes one of the things that can fix it for people is arch supports, or if you just tape their arches, pick their arches back up, that puts some slack in that tendon. And so that takes some pressure off it, that can help with shin splints. The other thing that, that David mentioned, you talked about stretching, did you do a bunch of calf stretching? Yeah. So another common thing with that is calf stretching. So tibialis anterior picks up your foot, your, your big calf muscles in the back do the opposite. They help you push off. It's called plantar flexion. So when you stand on your tippy toes, that's your calf muscles. Um, and so if your calf muscles are too big and strong for tibialis anterior, they can basically cause it to, to overwork, and then that can cause inflammation as well. So it can be any number of those things. But um, again, one of the more common things is, is uh, change in volume. So you get it like it's typically an early season injury, like uh, basketball players, volleyball players, like really early in the season tend to get shin splints, and they kind of go away after that. Um, so it's, it's a acute overuse um, or the change in surface stuff. So anyway, shin splints are periostitis, it's inflammation of the periosteum. Connor? That's okay. Um, as an aside, sometimes the muscle in the back, tibialis posterior is involved. And oftentimes if you actually read up on shin splints, it'll talk about tibialis posterior because it also holds up your arch. But in my experience, almost everyone complains of pain on the front of their shins. Almost nobody comes in talking about pain on the back. So anyway, uh, and then the endosteum, so going back here, the endosteum, it runs along those uh, trabeculae. So those, the, the spider web on the inside of the bone, that trabecular bone, it has a layer of, of tissue around it called the endosteum. And the endosteum is just like the osteogenic layer in the periosteum, where we laid, it has a bunch of osteoblasts, immature bone cells, where we lay down new bone. So the endosteum is responsible for helping remodel the trabecular bone, the spongy bone on the inside. Hematopoietic tissue, so anything hemato deals with the blood. And then poetic is the origin of, so hematopoietic tissue is blood that, or sorry, is tissue where you get the origin of blood. And so that's your red bone marrow. And again, your red bone marrow inside of your flat bones in adults. In kids, it's also in the long bones, but again, as they develop, that gets replaced with yellow marrow. All right, and this will probably be the last thing to do today. So, bone cells. So they all have osteo in the name, almost all of them. So they kind of run, 
from top to bottom, at least those first three, are kind of young to old or immature to mature. So osteogenic cells, again, anything that, that's genic generates something. So osteogenic cells generate bone cells. So they're a type of stem cell. So one of the things we talked about before the last exam was microfracture surgery, where they'll go in inside of a joint and actually put a bunch of holes in uh, the articular surface of that bone. And if you puncture through the cortical bone and you get into the trabecular bone, you have a bunch of stem cells in there. And the stem cells they're trying to, to get are actually one layer back or a little bit older, less mature, than the osteogenic cells. So you have stem cells inside of that, um, inside of the bone between the, the trabeculae that then mature into osteogenic cells. Osteogenic cells mature into osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are just like chondroblasts or fibroblasts. And what do chondroblasts and fibroblasts do? What's their job? Anybody remember? We've all tuned it out. <laughs> It's all right. So what I'm fishing for is that all those blasts generate the extracellular matrix. So they lay down the ground substance, but more important for us is they generate the collagen. So remember your fibroblasts generate the collagen that forms your tendons and ligaments. The osteoblasts generate the collagen that forms the sort of mesh network for the bone. Because what we're going to do to calcify bone is originally, or initially, we're going to lay down this sort of um, this spider web or this matrix of collagen fibers that the osteoblasts generate. And then we're going to put a bunch of calcium crystals between those fibers. And that's what, what gives bone its hardness. So the osteoblasts, though, the thing to know, they generate the, the collagen. So they, they generate that initial uh, scaffolding that we're going to then calcify to make bone hard. They mature into osteocytes. And we'll talk about that whole process next time. The osteocytes are your mature cells. Those are responsible for fixing any of the uh, damage to the matrix or fixing any of the damage to the collagen. Um, and they are actually connected to each other. So the osteocytes actually have um, junctions with each other where they're, they're physically connected to a neighboring osteocyte and they have what's called gap junctions. So they're these little doors effectively or little channels that charged particles move through. And that's a way that those osteocytes communicate with each other. And that's important because that helps direct bone remodeling. So if you get an area of the bone that's getting rep repetitively compressed, that's going to cause um, essentially a, an electrical signal to move from one osteocyte to another. And that then initiates the process of signaling to the, the osteoblasts that, hey, we need some more, we need to lay down some more matrix. So on that um, osteogenic layer of the periosteum. And then the bone lining cells are where the bone's not remodeling. So Certain areas of the bone don't turn over, but every give or take 10 years, maybe a little bit longer, like the, the midpoint of the femur, those shaft cells don't turn over very often. And so there's bone lining cells there that, that can fix the matrix, but they're not as good at doing that as the osteocytes. And then osteoclasts, whoops, we'll do that next time. Osteoclasts break down bone. So osteoclasts have a role. If your blood calcium gets too low, they'll actually break down the bone matrix and then free up that calcium. But they also, if there's damaged bone, they'll go through and break that down as well. So they play a really important role in bone remodeling. And we'll talk about that in more detail next time. So for now, the thing to know is that osteoblasts are the builders. They build bone up. They lay down the initial collagen. And then the clasts break things down. All right, so we'll finish up that stuff on Friday. And then, like I said, move on to the hip. Don't forget to take your quiz tomorrow.